so funny. I just assume when we say OSU in general that that means Ohio State University, but I realize that I'm in the wrong territory to have to make that assumption. <laughs> but um, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you all for having me here. I'm really excited to be here to speak with you a little, a little bit about my experience uh, and some observations uh, that have led to the, the series of things that I'll talk about today. Um, so I'm hoping that I will, um, that all the technical stuff will work out. We had a little, few challenges as we were setting up, but I think it should go okay. Um, so uh, I'm, hopefully what I'll do today is share a little bit more about the literature um, and impact of burnout in primary care, talk a little bit about the quadruple aim and uh, the 10 building blocks of high-performing primary care, <coughs> both of which have been articulated by uh, my predecessor at the Center for Excellence in Primary Care, Dr. Tom Bodenheimer. Uh, and then also talk a little bit about some strategies to get to that fourth aim and what the future of primary care may look like. So that's what I'm hoping to accomplish in this <coughs> short amount of time. So I, I uh, shared this a uh, couple of months ago with, uh, with another group. Um, it was a day, I, I journal a lot. I've been journaling for years since I was in college and write a lot about my days. And um, it's, it's, it's sometimes therapeutic for me and now it's almost an obsession. So. I, I do it every day, and I, I had a really, really stressful uh, clinic day, and I, my clinical practice is at San Francisco General Hospital and their Family Health Center um, in the San Francisco Safety Net. And so I, um, I kind of kept this particular journal entry close because I, I think it highlights a lot about why primary um, <coughs> care can be so tough. So I'll just read a little bit from it. So uh, start off, I went to my team huddle. We were short staffed, so we had to share MEAs, or as we call them in the network, the medical <coughs> system. And, only allowed to get stat labs, and all depression screens were deferred. So I finished pre huddling on my charts and ordered the mammograms and uh, fecal Im immunochemical testing needed for my patients. My first patient was very upset, told me through the Vietnamese interpreter that she had called for the past two weeks to get her lab results and refills of her medications. I checked, I did review the labs and, and timestamped them and sent them to the queue for normal labs, and her e electronic refill request was sitting in the attending queue. My second patient needed a doctor letter to obtain a discount on his fishing license. The medical assistants were not doing letters today, so I wrote it rather than have him come back. I ran behind schedule. Everyone was upset. The next patient, uh, Mr. X, as I'll call him, came in with his daughter, the Cantonese-speaking patient with advanced Parkinson's disease. He needed labs, and the staff said he had to go to the main hospital to get them done. I argued and argued that this was too much for him and that they make an exception so he did not have to go. I finished my morning at 12.30, none of the staff was available. I worked on prior authorizations for a few patients and my uh, electronic health record bubbles, refills, and labs until about 1.15 p.m. I was late for my 1 p.m. meeting and I did not have lunch. So that's kind of how that, that morning went. Does that sound familiar to anybody in this room or is that just a crazy day that only happens every, every day? All right, so that's the day that I, that I had and we'll come back to that in a moment. So yeah, where did you fit the journal in you? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's <laughs> a very question. The only way to decompress that kind of day for me is to, to write about, and somehow putting it to paper just it doesn't solve it, but you know, makes it feel a little bit better. So um, like, like me, I'm sure you've all heard a lot about kind of the death spiral and primary care is dead, and uh, we have a, a lot of challenges that we, we really actually face in primary care. Uh, there are a number of things that have been written about this, uh, and it's actually hard to really reframe this conversation, but the theory is that we have many, many primary care physicians, providers across the country, uh, but the, the, our current practice is really unsustainable. And I, it, there's, a, there's a piece that I read in Forbes that had said, you know, although we have so many primary care um, physicians in the United States, more than any other specialty, uh, we just somehow lack the power and social influence necessary to chart our course. So that's, that's kind of the reality that we're working with. And then, so it's no wonder when you see this, and I'm not sure people have seen this, this, is, this was a projection about the, the um, kind of primary care physician supply and demand shortage, and we're all, we've all heard that by 2020 we're going to be short 40,000 primary care physicians to take care of our, a growing adult population. Uh, even with nurse practitioners and physician assistants uh, uh, kind of contributing and becoming part of the primary care clinician workforce, it's still not likely to make a big dent in our supply. So it feels like we don't, we're just kind of almost an extinct species. So this you know, this cartoon says maybe there'll be some primary care doctors available on this planet. And I, I use, I actually will let you know that I try to infuse a little bit of humor in these talks because it's, it's not the easiest set of talks to give. Um, and then when you look at patients, you know, for, for the most part, a lot of patients are very dissatisfied with, with primary care and, and the processes and the bureaucracies that we have. 
Um, and so it's not as if the patients are really happy with it, but the providers and the clinicians are, are, are frustrated. It's, it's really a lot of people that are frustrated. So this is an, another one just, you know, kind of alluding to the weights. But we know that primary care has tremendous opportunity. It's really considered the cornerstone, not only in the United States, but across the world. And we do a lot of work internationally, but as the foundation for any effective healthcare system. Uh, we have a lot of opportunity. We have, uh, our, our, this is a statement that ARC had put out about primary care practice, but that we have unprecedented opportunity to emphasize quality improvement and redesign that could really transform the whole health system. So with that, I'm gonna to try to ask you guys, I'm gonna put a little quiz, just to make sure people are with me, and ask if anybody knows who this little girl is, but just by show of hands, people know who she is? Dora is your friend. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, might, she might be, anyone else want to take a thought of Doc McStuffins. Doc McStuffins, yeah, so Doc McStuffins, she might be Dora's friend, and they, they, it would be great if they were friends. Um, she is a six-year-old Disney character. Her, her um, my, my daughter loves this show, and um, she, fixes toys, stuffed animals, and provides personal care to them. And whenever I watch the show um, with my daughter, it just makes me think a lot about why I, I became a primary care physician. Because you know, I felt like I want to have these personal relationships, and I'm going to have this opportunity to heal and make people feel better. When, I, when I'm around, they'll be happy. Um, and we'll just have these wonderful relationships. And uh, when I got into it, I think you know, this is kind of what I found. It wasn't really <laughs> so much always that direct one-on-one -on -one with the patient and the family that I was hoping to connect with, but there was this whole system and this labyrinth uh, that surrounded them. And uh, this is just kind of depicting all the different synapses that as a primary care provider that I, I have to make contact with. Uh, this is by the Patient Center Primary Care Collaborative, but just that even being kind of focusing in being in a very effective uh, you know, medical home environment uh, can still be very difficult because of all the other points that our, our patients contact and our responsibility to kind of coordinate that. So uh, this will be no surprise to you, but the, you know, there are a lot of estimates about the workload of primary care physicians, uh, managing panels of over 2,000 in many settings, uh, interacting with hundreds of other uh, physicians and other practices, and to be able to do all of the evidence-based preventive acute and chronic care for that, that size panel will take about 21 hours a day to be able to do that uh, for, for the average primary care physician panel and then you wouldn't get to journal or anything if you, if you spent that kind of time. So really it feels like you just, it's, you know, a lot of primary care providers feel like they're, you know, uh, hamsters in this wheel and they're just spinning and it's hard to really see what, what, what um, any positive uh, outlook on their future. And then it also feels a little bit difficult because we spend so much time on the non-clinical parts of our job. And so this one says, you know, the, the nurse or medical assistant is saying to the patient, I'm sorry, the doctor no longer makes diagnoses. Because it feels like, you know, when it, it, a lot of my days feel like I'm spending so much time just doing all these paperwork and calling and tracking things down, and it uh, doesn't necessarily feel like I'm doing kind of the, the clinical uh, sleuth work that I, I hope to do. So we have this situation where we have these very large panel sizes. Um, you can't really reduce them because there, we have a shortage that we're expecting to have primary care clinicians. And so you have these larger panels, poor access, um, poor quality, burnout, um, and then Clearly, um, as we've seen, fewer medical students will enter into, this, into these careers because it, it, it doesn't look very attractive. And uh, when you're in the safety net, which is where all my practice has been since I finished training, um, uh, and like many of you, there are all these additional realities of the lives of our patients, um, including literacy and, and uh, socioeconomic challenges and social determinants and uh, challenges of care coordination. So uh, people have really been describing this, uh, this challenge of burnout in medicine just in general. So uh, I, you, you may have seen this back in 2012. Uh, Shanna Felt and her colleagues released this, this study that was really, really um, remarkable in terms of what it found that you know, physicians uh, have higher rates of professional burnout than all other US uh, professional workers. Uh, more likely to be dissatisfied or with their with their work, experience uh, bona fide symptoms of burnout, and less likely to uh, believe that they have work life balance. So that's just physicians compared with other U.S. professional workers. And then um, digging deeper and looking at kind of who who is burnout as when you look at all these groups of physicians and who has the higher rates of burnout among those groups, you see that some of their frontline staff emergency physicians critical care, but family medicine is also up there, pretty high. Um, and uh, general internal medicine also, uh, well, and that, those are you know, experiencing one of the you know, three major kind of uh, components of burnout, which loss of enthusiasm, cynicism, 
low sense of professional efficacy or personal accomplishment. Um, in pediatrics, t actually tend to do quite well it, comparatively to, um, to the other physicians. And so they explore this a little further, what are the primary causes? A lot of people say, well, it's hard, you know, as, as physicians, you get compassion fatigue, you're, you're spending so much time investing your energy and your emotions in all these other patients, um, in all your patients, but what they found that that wasn't really the primary thing. A lot of what, what really kind of topped the charts was uh, having too many bureaucratic tasks, spending too many hours at work, uh, feeling like a cog in the wheel, impact of VCA. So those were some of the things. And uh, but and it matters not just because you know it's 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 different than the rest of the population or diff different than the other physician groups, but also we've seen that physicians or clinicians that are that are uh, distressed or that are experiencing burnout have a very difficult time uh, being able to uh, give that you know compassion to their patients, more likely to make errors, communicate poorly with their teams, and also have are at high risk for depression and substance abuse. We've quite, kind of created this perfect storm where you know all these different it's it, it, all these different regu regulations and, and transformations and uh, the, tra the transitions to electronic environments as well as kind of balancing our, our responsibilities to many different uh, people that we're accountable to or organizations we're accountable to has, has created this and perpetuated it. So you know, we have states and our organizations, evidence-based standards, payers that are asking us to do a number of different things. For the most part, we hope that these things would be aligned and that we would be responsible to report and, and collect the same information and have the same set of standards for everybody that we're working with, but it's not necessarily always the case. So in some cases you can have competing demands and we just created this this storm that um, has perpetuated this this primary care crisis, which is from <laughs> So this is another one. I feel like this is a good moment to throw another one in. Um, this one says, it's bad news, your illness isn't our, our performance targets. And so um, sometimes it feels like that for our poor patients. So it was in this context, you know, a few years ago that um, D Don Berwick described what everyone knows now as a triple aim, um, with you know thinking about we have to really create a, a shift from thinking solely about that one interaction to how we can really improve the experience of care for patients at large, uh, improve the health of our populations at large, and reduce the cost of doing so. But even with that, we started to see that uh, a, a newer paradigm was real, really still necessary to, to to maintain and sustain that workforce, and so. The burnout literature has just continued to say we've got to focus on this problem of our physicians and our clinicians and even other members of the care team, uh, you know, burning out. And there's a lot of there are a lot of tools and, and thoughts about doing this. This is a um, a paper by Mark Linzer and his colleagues in Chicago that was looking at uh, how to pre prevent physician burnout. This was in the Journal of General Internal Medicine, so it was targeted primarily towards primary care people, but looking at a number of different places where uh, you could, institutions uh, could focus their attention to prevent burnout. So they focused on institutional things, the conditions of the environment itself, career development, and self-care. I'm going to talk about a couple of those ones um, as we go forward with some of my experiences. So the goals kind of evolve from we're going to look at this triple aim uh, to the quadruple aim. and. Uh, Earlier this year, um, Dr. Tom Bodenheimer, my, my boss, and Dr. Krasinski articulated this and described this fourth aim, which is now the provider experience. And that is provider in the larger sense of the clini clinician as well as the other members of the care team. And when they, in their paper, they said, as they visited primary care practices all around the country and really talked about uh, people pursuing this triple aim, they, they, they said, you know, what we keep finding is that people are saying, we, we're really looking at triple aim. We're trying to really meet some of these these goals, but the the challenges that we're facing with our cl clinical staff and our staff really impedes our ability to be able to get to those aims. So if we don't have a workforce to do this, then we'll never get to the other three. So that's that's the the context in which this this uh, emerged. And so uh, my my center does a lot of work in helping practices as they're going through the process of transformation using again uh, another uh, another product of, of Dr. Bodenheimer's the ten building blocks of high performing primary care, helping people think about how do you go through the process of transformation, what are the critical steps, which ones are first, which ones come after, and um, and how do you how do these all sync up to get to that fourth aim? And our, our, our thinking is that, you, you know, we have to really think differently from the way uh, we, we started uh, and that we can't really solve problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. So at this point, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sh share a couple of videos with you in a moment, but I want to I wanna first just show, explain to you what, we're, what this, this exercise is. So have, have people seen this before? People have done this? 
Maybe, okay, so maybe some, maybe some. So this is, I, I like to actually do this in these particular talks. So this is uh, a test. So you had a quiz before, now this is the test. It's the real test. So you have to go as fast as you can and say the color that you see, not the word that you need. <coughs> Everyone got it? We're going to do it. Ready? Go. Red. Okay, here you go. <laughs> Okay, you guys are just, you guys are just, this is not <laughs> it's, kind of, it's, it's kind of difficult, okay, so I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you two very, very quick video clips and hope that this will work um, walking through this. So the first one is going to be my son when he was seven, doing this. Blue, orange, red, yellow, brown, green, black, green. <laughs> Orange, red, blue. Okay, so I cut him off because he, he was having a hard time. But let me show you my, my daughter, who's four years old at the time that we did this test. Blue, orange, red, yellow, green, black, green, orange. Great. So. <laughs> And then my son, of course, wanted a do-over because he's like, oh, man, this is not fair. You're going to show this to people? Um, but so what do you guys think about that, like the difference between those two kiddos? Because she can't read yet. Okay, so yeah, so she couldn't read at that point. Um, had no real preconceived anything at that point. I, but I, I've, lost, I've actually lost this here. Yeah, I'm sorry. But yeah, so she was, um, she... Could in obviously he could at that point, but just thinking about you know if you if you try to fix things based on exactly what you know or what you think you what is what has been done before and you don't come into these opportunities to transform with a really open mind, it's very difficult to get past what you already believe. And so that's that's kind of um, the point of that. Okay, so yeah, so in that kind of in that spirit of thinking differently, uh, some of what was described as quadruple aim. How do we make the experience better for our providers? Why why do we have to do you know? Kind of fix exactly what's broken. Sometimes we can think of things that haven't even been thought of or done. And so there's a lot that was uh, described in that paper about what could actually be done to improve that. And um, this slide is kind of a crosswalk between the quadruple aim, particularly that fourth aim, and uh, the crosswalk between the building blocks. And so some of the things that they found have really been documented to improve the experience of the clin clinicians or the care team is uh, scribing, for example, having other members of the care team provide some support and documentation. Uh, that not only for kind of staff experience, but also uh, revenue and efficiency benefits, uh, allowing the team to manage more people. Um, some of this isn't necessarily you know rocket science or new to people, but pre-visit planning and um, pre-appointment laboratory testing. Chris Sinsky's written a lot about that. Um, reducing waste, um, kind of having really good systems to be able to review and triage labs accordingly. Expanding the roles of nurses and medical assistants in the environment. Uh, I know that when I was in my former setting, as a chief medical officer, uh, which I'll talk about briefly, uh, we had a lot of resistance from our my um, provider staff in expanding the scope of practice for some of our our, our other clinical team members. But uh, when you're able to to adopt and, and use uh, you know physician reviewed and evidence based standing orders for other clinical care team members, it actually gets a lot of efficiencies for you. Um, also, um, the workflow standardization of, of uh, prescription refills. So a lot of places and people and, and clinicians get bogged down by the amount, the number of refills that they get. The electronic health record has kind of shifted that work from other people that handled that before directly to the provider's inbox. So having other dedicated staff that can actually go through and do some of those things helps a lot. And then clearly co-location um, increases the efficiency of the care teams in general. So I wanted to share a few, a little bit of experience. Um, as I mentioned, uh, prior to my move to San Francisco, I was the chief medical officer of a community health center uh, system in, in Connecticut, uh, where I was for eight years and five of those as a CMO, with sites all over the state of Connecticut. Um, very similar to the organizations that you guys are here from and serve, um, but you know, largely uh, socioeconomically uh, deprived. Uh, and vulnerable population, um, and and in my position, I had a lot of challenges, including uh, this will sound very familiar to anybody that is in one of these leadership positions. But uh, you know, you have multiple sites spread out all over the county, from the Rhode Island board to the 
um, Massachusetts border, the New York border, and some of the sites were, were big with a lot of a lot of providers. Some were small, so people definitely felt isolated, and if they weren't closer to the kind of the mothership in Central Connecticut, high rates of uh, provider turnover of all providers, um, MPs, uh, PAs, uh, physicians, a lot of activity in the area of, provi of practice transformation. That people there were a lot of changes and. Just in that period that I was there, a lot of change that was going on. Um, very big frustrations with access to specialty care for our providers and our patients just frustrated with the whole thing. Um, and so we started to look at how can we apply some of these um, strategies. We didn't, uh, clearly this, this, this description of what um, uh, some strategies are wasn't there when I was um, in my position, but when I look at it now, I realize where some of these things fell. I'm particularly focusing on number one, six, and eight. Um, the health center started a, a real intense focus on quality improvement. I uh, got a chief quality officer with whom I worked very closely with, and we started to train a lot of our clinical teams in the clinical microsystems um, model of, of practice improvement, uh, and really uh, de deployed all of these uh, coaches to the various sites, trained a number of people within the organization to become coaches, but then had people that were uh, at the individual sites that would serve as leaders of their quality improvement teams and have uh, both the authority to kind of think of what, what the challenges were and how to explore them, and also to really empower the frontline staff and the people that were in those sites to decide what made sense as far as what they would focus on. So did a lot of work in terms of uh, what, what kind of things the QI teams would come up with. We would let the site say, you know, we, we really want to focus on this um, and try to align that with organizational priorities. But it, and in some cases, there were things that, you know, we have an organizational imperative to do this, but for the most part, the actual QI teams at the site were, were working on uh, products that were relevant to their, their, their location. So I just want to share one of these with you, and I really like um, sharing these slides. So this is one that had, had come up. Um, we were doing a lot of work on, on PCMH and trying to figure out how to report on, uh, on things that were missed, and we, uh, our chief quality officer and I had gone to, through this training with GE. And one of the things they asked us was, you know, they were talking about, you know, if, if GE, you know, it has, if a, a bolt in the plane is one hundredth of a millimeter off, you know, that can lead to a huge, you know, catastrophe and that defect is, is disastrous. So what's, what, you know, what do you guys consider defects for you, for you guys in, in healthcare? We, we certainly didn't have anything that drastic, but we thought, we started to think, okay, well, a woman gets, you know, breast cancer because she, you know, we missed screening or things like that. And so we created what was called the Missed Opportunities Dashboard. And so what this shows you is, uh, providers on this side, and what we initially gave them was uh, missed opportunities. And it, you know, in retrospect, it probably wasn't the, the right language, but uh, but it. Uh, but what we did is posted this on our SharePoint site, posted this at all the sites where we would look at you know a patient that came in that was due for A1C testing as a diabetic. How many times um, that last week did you miss the opportunity to do that? Or breast cancer, colorectal cancer, or cervical cancer screening? Does that make sense to people? How that was. So what happened is we, when we first did it, you know, and, the, and the teams were excited about how to work with this, and so we sent it out, and this is basically what it showed, and people would say, okay, so I missed, you know, I missed seven opportunities, great. So um, the, working with the teams at the site, you know, the, the provider said, you know, what would be really useful is if I knew who I missed this on, right? Like this isn't actionable for me at all. So it, this, this, these are now hyperlinked, um, and you could actually click, and then you would see which patients came in. This is their chart number. This is the day they came in. What specifically did you miss on them? And at first, you know, it was very difficult to roll this out because, you know, everybody thought this was just, it was, it was horrible. It was public shaming and you know, nobody wanted to be on this wall at the top of this list. This is one list that none of our providers wanted to be at the top of. And so, but look at what happened, you know, as we started to do this. Um, so this is week by week from the time we implemented it, um, almost, almost a, a year. So in the beginning, these are, this is like the number of missed opportunities. So in the beginning we saw, um, when we started looking at it, tons of opportunities that, that were missed for our patients. Again, not casting blame, but just saying you know, that things could get better. But over time, as we continued to publish this, as nobody wanted to be at the top of that list, and we got really good information um, and guidance and thoughts from our QI teams to say, we need this to be actionable, we saw really significant reductions in what was getting missed. And you know, we'd have M MAs you know, come in and say, no way, you, know, you guys said that we missed this mammogram when we didn't because she said she, you know, she, she, you know, she, didn't, she got it and we just didn't get the result back or things like that. And so it also helped us to start thinking about how do we document things that happen outside, how do we, um, how do we you know, use kind of similar strategies to mention that things were declined, you know, things like that. So that's, 
that's when they came. But that was really something that was was the product of a lot of the thought of the, our, our our frontline staff. Um, other things that we did uh, were um, we we d developed an academic kind of flavor for people because people said, you know, I, I left residency. I've been in practice for so long. Unless I go to a CME conference, which um, one conference eats up my entire budget of uh, CME allotment. Um, I don't have any other ways to learn. I'm by myself. You know, I don't have anybody to run things by. So we developed a American Academy of Family Physicians accredited CME granting program by, through which we would bring our providers together once a month, have a, a statewide grand rounds, the speaker in a central location. People could dial in through video conference and really help to kind of bring a spirit of ongoing learning into the environment. Uh, started to really redesign the way our care teams function so that we could share care among different members of the care team and reduce some of the, uh, the things that were taking a lot of people's time. We also introduced um, provider specific questions on our uh, employee satisfaction uh, work uh, uh, um, <coughs> surveys. I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Because uh, for, prior to that, there was the gen general employee satisfaction surveys that the organization did. And providers definitely felt like, you know, my, I'm not, my voice is not here. Are there, there are things about being on call. There are things about responding to clubs that I need to actually be able to express. So really introduce a number of provi provider specific things. And with, with, with action on what would happen, you know, based on what people said. Um, as I mentioned, developed a lot of opportunities for quality improvement, but also um, scholarly work for our providers and um, mentoring opportunities for medical, nursing students, and residents. So we saw over time, we had a few um, periods where we had um, intense action and activity as we were transforming to become patient-centered medical homes, and then things kind of calmed down uh, over time. And this, the, the two arrows represent kind of when our, a lot of our PCMH transformation activity happened and when the QI um, infrastructure was, was developed and built. And started to see over time that we really, and I, and, I, and, I, and I will just admit that I cannot say what of those things led to this. I mean, it's probably a combination of a number of things. I can't say, you know, if we didn't have the QI teams, we wouldn't have had this. But we really saw significant reductions in our turnover and the vacancies that we had um, for our primary care providers. Um, and by the time I, I left in 2013, we were really at, almost at a low. And I, I think it's, it's, it started to creep back up, but I think it's actually leveled out, as, as, as I've heard, with some more opportunities for people. So. Um, again, like I said, a number of different innovations and strategies were built, were kind of built into the system at the same time, trying to get people engaged, um, trying to really uh, respect and appreciate this need for ongoing professional growth and also uh, active, act, being active and feeling empowered as providers in that setting. So looking towards the future, another, another uh, moment of comic relief, um, and just describing this 10th block. I didn't really go into the building blocks, but we, did, we described this 10th block as you know, once you engage your leadership, you've got good systems to collect data and use that to drive improvement. You've impaneled your patients so every patient knows who their primary care provider and care team is and, and the teams know who their patients are. You've really optimized the way you use your care teams. Patients are in partnership with those teams. Uh, you have systems and data to drive population management, uh, good continuity of care uh, designs, access to care. Uh, and then you're coordinating care in the larger medical neighborhood that we talked about earlier, and that, then you kind of are able to, to get to this. In some cases, some of these things happen before the others, but I'll show a little bit about what we mean by that one. Um, and really, again, it kind of shifts from the traditional 15, 20 minute visit to thinking about how can we spread uh, the work among different members of the care team, optimize what, um, what everybody's doing, have people op operating at the top of their license, um, and really get to that fourth aim. So this is kind of, um, this is probably looks very similar to the schedules that most of you have or see or, or manage. Uh, so there's a, a provider here, a provider here, a medical system that supports that provider, a medical system that supports that provider, maybe a nurse that helps kind of support both of the teams. Um, in many cases spends a lot of time on, on triage and just getting all kinds of stuff that nurses are loaded with all the time. Um, in many cases, not really at the at the highest level of their their capabilities. But um, so patient A is seen, and the medical system assists with patient A. Patient B is seen, assists with patient B. So that's kind of what a, a, a typical day might look like. And you you know you run through the morning, and for every patient, there's that that little support. And then um, sorry, um, this is what we like to describe as potentially a template of the future, right? So instead of that, in that same time frame. Um, you know, the team, this whole team, so this is one big team, uh, huddles together, or maybe some, some smaller combinations like the teamlets. Uh, there's time for electronic visits, maybe in phone calls here. 
um, for the provider and then the medical assistant who's trained in panel management um, maybe does some outreach and inreach there. Uh, together they see some complex patients uh, uh, in, in, in where they're both needed. Uh, maybe there's some time for coordination, another huddle, the, uh, the medical assistant does some health coaching if she's got those, he or she's got those skills. The nurse is doing care management, maybe doing independent visits for blood pressure or diabetes or CAPD based on some standing orders and some care guidelines that have been provided. Um, another provider or baby spends time, doesn't have to be an NP, but spends time maybe seeing some of the acute patients, maybe they huddle later in the day and also do some panel management. And, uh, and so it just looks a lot different. And, and usually when people first see this slide, there's no possible way we could ever, ever do this where I am. It's just would never work, never happen. Um, and I, you know, in many cases it, it actually can. And um, you see that in the first you know, few hours of the day, you're actually contacting, I mean, not necessarily seeing in our, in our visit means money um, model, you're actually contacting significantly more numbers of patients potentially if, if with things like this. So I had a chance, oh, this is just another um, colorful depiction of the same thing. Um, an example to visit Iora Health, which is the multi-site system that's, that's um, which I visited their Massachusetts sites a, a few months ago, but they're, um, they're expanding. It's largely an employer or, um, or uh, organizational-based insurance coverage model, so they have a lot of flexibility in how they can design and construct their schedules and, um, as, and, and their, team, um, their team models. For example, every uh, uh, team has three health coaches, medical assistant health coaches, that are assigned to work with the, with the provider. The patients get a lot of support, a lot of direct support, both inside and outside of the office. And so this was a, a sample of a schedule. Um, everybody huddles in the morning on their patients. There are all these slots that you can see that are called hold time slots where the provider can decide uh, what that would be used for. Um, you know, it could be a chronic disease visit. You could say, I, know, I, need, I need two slots for this person. And you can also see that the visit slots are a little bit longer. These um, things that have the telephones by them are the times that are blocked for telephone calls. So I have an appointment with this patient at 12 o'clock, but it's a telephonic appointment. She can't miss work or you know, has some other reason that we, we want to just do this by phone. And there, uh, I spoke with one of the providers that worked there who had left another um, uh, clinic setting in Boston and come to practice there. And she said, I can't imagine ever going back to the, the, old, the old hamster wheel that I was on. Um, really have feel like they have the time to dedicate to their patients and, um, and and the ability to support them in ways that may not necessarily be traditional, like you know through the phone, through electronic uh, interactions and, and things like that. So that that's just an example of, of somewhere that's that's actually doing that, and clearly their you know their model allows for them to do that. So it kind of all gets back to thinking differently. Um, you know, we, we tend to focus on what we cannot fix and how difficult it is to do anything in the environments that we're in. But a lot of, uh, of our work at my center is really not only just kind of identifying, um, describing, and really spreading, disseminating best practices in primary care innovation, but also trying to lobby for, for uh, policy reforms and financial reforms that will help support some of this work. So we're just literally um, uh, kind of a few days away, uh, away from, from our state recently signed some very new legislation around uh, Medicaid reform and we're, we're excited to have a, a number of community health centers that are going to be part of this pilot to shift from the volume to value um, reimbursement model, um, modeling it kind of after what Oregon did. So I think California is on the second state that's actually um, gone to this level of, of Medicaid reform. So we're excited about things like that and the opportunity to really say, okay, if we, if we have, now we have Medicaid is saying just tell us what it would look like and let's test out what this might look like and try different things and see what what we get and so hoping as this goes out go rolls out that people will really start to think a little bit differently about it so I have um, also written down what I th what I'd like a day to look like so that you remember that that day I described um, a few months ago in my clinic um, and I'll just read you my this didn't happen this is just a, what I would like to happen but I would like to have read to you guys in the beginning so I went to my team huddle, we had adequate staffing, and the medical assistant had prepared all the charts with vaccines and cancer screening orders. All of my patients who had labs before had re received a call or a letter regarding their labs prior to my visit. The labs I needed were done prior to me seeing the patient um, or because a medical assistant or a health coach did pre-visit planning. All the patients that needed additional information or services were connected to the team nurse for support. My workflow was managed with my nurse so that she and I split the schedule. She saw the blood pressure follow-ups under standing order. I saw some of the more complex patients. I had dedicated time to answer patient questions by phone or email. I also had a dedicated team member to complete my prior authorizations. 
The nurse managed medical referrals under a standing order. My health coach counseled my patients and their chronic diseases. I finished on time, went to the meeting, and I had lunch. So that's the day I'd like to have. So with that, I will stop and thank you for your time and your attention and for bearing with me in the technical difficulties. And um, anybody that's seen this speak before knows I always show a picture of my kids at the end. So even if you didn't think I did a good job, they, they think I did. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'll stop and entertain any questions. Any questions that people have or reactions? Well, one of the things that you work in an academic center. Yeah. Uh, how does this work in dealing with the teaching model where you have people coming through? Yeah, thank you for that question. We actually have, so in the uh, teaching center, we've actually seen some of this, some of those blocks that I talked about, the building blocks, are much more difficult to actually uh, get to in the teaching environment, particularly around um, continuity and access, because you know, you have, you know, my department, we have like 500 volunteer and um, other faculty and, and core clinical faculty who work you know, half day to a day here and there, sometimes once a month, um, and then all the residents that are kind of you know, going through at various stages with very little clinical time in the first year and then a little bit more as they get to the third year. Um, and so we've been looking at, out and actually trying to figure out what are some models that, um, that have worked to help stabilize these teams. So one, one that, um, that we really like is the kind of the team anchor model where many of the academic settings also have uh, other providers that are actually there full time and trying to make sure that everyone that is either v, uh, like a volunteer or, or, or a very small FTE faculty is paired up with a, with a team anchor. So in many cases that's our, our NPs or PAs that are full time clinical staff uh, who's responsible for kind of covering things when, 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 the, other, when the faculty are away or also um, being the go-to person in kind of in, in the space between their clinical time. Um, and then we also have, a, um, in, a, in my particular setting, but also in, in others that we've seen, the models where you have resident buddy systems. So, you know, two residents, maybe a 30 in the first year, one who's there in clinic more, one who's there in clinic less, are actually buddies, and people know that, uh, you know, you can send things to one or both of them, and that those kind of things tend to work. Access to your exact PCP is very difficult, and I'll just, there's no, because, you know, you, you might see someone else on that team and not necessarily that PCP. So that's one thing that doesn't necessarily get solved um, in our teaching setting. Yeah. But I think, but just, to, just, to, just before I take another question, I think that it's really important that you communicate very clearly about what that is. So for example, I, you know, I'm in clinic Mondays and Tuesdays and my, my patients know that I'm not there in clinic Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, and if they want to be seen that day, it's not going to be me. And I very, you know, we, can, we talk about that and they, they know it. So I think just communicating very well about what that might look like when you're not around um, also helps set expectations for people. Yeah. What do you see are the biggest obstacles between your current days and your future? Yeah. What do you see as your vision for the future? One thing I, I think is, it's one major hur hurdle that I see, um, which it would be no surprise, is, is the way our payment system rewards or, or, or kind of uh, kind of values our visits and so uh, you can't really say you know a nurse can spend a couple hours doing this if there's no reimbursement for her to be able to do that unless you have some other stream that will that will kind of um, monetize put some mo money around that or, or shift from money to a value weight thinking strategy so I think that's the biggest the biggest hurdle that that we have but another thing that I would say is that um, I don't, we, we don't, and I'm talking about even in my own setting, like we don't, I don't think we fully optimize what our teams can do. I mean, our, our nurses work so hard. We did a time study when I was at Community Health Center in Connecticut looking at our nurses because our, our providers would say, well, I can't use my nurse for this because, you know, he or she's so busy. They're just busy all day. They're just busy. And we say, well, what are they doing? They're like, I don't know, but they're just busy. I can't go to them. And so we did a time study looking at kind of what the nurses were doing an observational study and found out that they were spending so much time on the phone tracking down papers and faxing things that someone said didn't get through and just kind of just this dumping so many things on such a high, highly um, valued, valuable and precious resource um, just made no sense. So I think we're also underutilizing other members of our care team because we can't figure out, you know, people just say, well, I, if I don't send it to the nurse, I don't know who to send it to. And the nurse will take care of it and, you know, he or she will make sure it happens. And so that's another issue that I see is that we just don't spread some of that stuff among other members of the care team. Uh, I'm going to risk being um, sort of silly and criticizing the model. Sure. Um, 
I think I'd love to see the, the quadruple lane re represented more as a tetrahedron instead of four squares, because mm -hmm. then the provider would touch all three of the other sides, yeah, yeah, and it's more stable. And I think we probably do need to recognize that if if that's not working, then you know you got to build something on everything. So I'm going to make a pitch for the provider experience to be the bottom of the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. No, I, li I like that. Yeah, we definitely went into that. Graphic. I mean, I, I think what you're what you're saying is is, is absolutely right. If if we don't have the provider, and as I said, they describe this as all the, all the members of the clinical team, medical assistants, nurses. You know, there's probably not a lot of literature on that, but but well, nursing will probably, but not medical assistants. But that's, those are also very high turnover um, positions as well. And so, uh, thinking about how do you they they touch everywhere, and if you don't have them, then you can't really do any of the rest. I like that. So our organization. Experiences a lot of change fatigue from all of our QI mm -hmm. efforts. So even um, getting from where you are today to your ideal, how do you keep everybody motivated when there's yeah. all this change fatigue and that in itself is stressful? Sure, very, very much so. I mean, I felt like in I, I, I didn't even ask. Are, are, are there you know, a medical director or like? clinical leadership in the room. So I felt like when I was, when we were first talking about the patient center medical home, that I felt like a car salesman. Like I was going to the sites and I was like, you gotta, we're gonna do this great thing and it's so awesome. It's all these things, it's great. And you know, you gotta get one, you gotta get it for yourself. And I, I remember feeling like, I, I don't know, like I just, people were just like, get her out of here. She's so obnoxious. And I, I know that that's very hard for people because they were just like, oh my gosh, this is one more thing that's gonna change all these things that we do. Um, the one thing that I feel like happen is that you know we, we always have the people that were like the very vocal first uh, kind of detractors they were just like this isn't going to work no way I'm not involved and a lot of times you know that the natural inclination is to dodge those people right and kind of have them in the back of the room try to keep them quiet give them some popcorn you know <laughs> but you know trying to actually bring those people in because you know I feel like if, if you if you can win over some of the people that are really exhausted or frustrated and kind of give them some decision-making capacity as you're rolling out some of these things, you can actually get them to help bring other people along. And so that's the kind of stuff that we did. It's, it's very painful to do that. I think you'll, you'll probably recognize it's exhausting to talk to someone who is really frustrated and is cynical and is just not happy to be there anymore. But trying to really win those people over, I think, is, is a good strategy. Because if you have the same people that are excited about change and they get it and they're always out there talking and people just say, yeah, I mean, it's just the same kind of core crew and you know, they're one of them, you know, they're not one of us, they don't know how to do it. And then I would also say, and I, and I think uh, this is really important, is to give people time to do some of this work. And so be really thoughtful about what that might look like. Because, you know, you can't say, and I, and I didn't talk about that in that slide about the QI teams, but you, you can't just say, you know, work through lunch and have your quality improvement team meeting. People also want to eat lunch and some people want to go, you know, visit their kids at daycare during lunch. I mean, there are a lot of things that people need to have that time. So try not to allow a lot of this to be on people's own time. You know, sometimes early morning, early mornings when things aren't necessarily that busy or sometimes, you know, there are other points of the day where you, where you know that you're not going to have as much demand for service or time to give people actual dedicated time in their work day to actually do some of the work. And I think that helps a lot. So I, I mean, I've, you know, looked at these kinds of models over and over again. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, that sounds great. That looks great. I'd love to, love to try to get there. And I think, so I'm the CMO, so I'm supposed to be the one who kind of reinvents this wheel and figures out how to change and shift and move everything into that. And I think to myself, yeah, that's probably not going to happen. <laughs> you know, I mean, so it seems like we're all sort of out there kind of on our own with a concept and trying to each invest in this kind of wheel, yeah. if you will. And so what's sort of nationwide, system-wide, I, I don't know what, but some way that we can sort of mobilize tools, training strategies, change leaders within, within this to help us all invent the same wheel together. Yeah. I'd be curious what other thoughts are. I mean, I don't, I don't, I, I don't think I have the right answers to those. I remember being a chief medical officer and feeling very lonely, and I didn't really have a peer group per se that you know that I could go to and say, you know, how are you guys handling this, and what are some things you're thinking of, and and also you know feeling like I would read about things maybe in journals or go to conferences and hear about things and come back and say them to the other members of my executive team, and they'd say, no, we don't, you know, we can't do that. It's not going to work, and then it'd be over, and feeling like I was the only person that was trying to do that and or that, or that was kind of fixed on this particular initiative at a time so I, I 
You know, I, I think one thing that helped me a lot was, find, you know, being able to go to other places in here and say, you know, they're doing this in Colorado and, you know, it's, it's really working well. They're, you know, they're, they're getting these kind of results. Um, I find that, you know, depending on the relationship between the, the chief medical clinical person and the financial and other executive leadership, um, they're, they're, there's language that we just don't, we don't speak the same language a lot of times. You know, someone's looking at, okay, you're going to do this, this is all great, and it's going to, you know, keep our providers and, it, and et cetera, but it's going to cost me this much to be able to do that, and if I block out clinical schedules, it's going to cost us this much. And so I, I found it really hard to, you know, be able to articulate some of what I wanted to do without having some people that I started to meet at conferences that could help me think, like, how did you say it? How did you get this done? And how did you push it? But I'd love to hear, does anybody else have a thought or reaction to that that you may want to share with us? We actually do, um, through our PCA, um, mm -hmm. every PCA we do, um, we meet every spring and every fall with all the CMOs from Montana mm. and our CHCs, and we share those kinds of exact things. So, are we from yeah. where we are, we go to each other's health centers, we take tours of the health center, talk to their staff, oh, wow. and learn from each other on our other successes and failures, and then we also have like the ability to email each other or get on like a blog together or whatever and share what what like maybe our own policies yeah struggles like right now the whole progressive discipline in montana is kind of difficult and so we're all learning how to train on that so that we can keep our providers there right right and not just write them off because we just don't want to do it so you know we gotta be able to like help them be successful not just hope they struggle through and get by yeah that's a nice structure to have. So do you guys have like sessions or, or things about kind of working session. with the, okay, yeah. So we have like, it's a, it's a full day that we usually meet, because Montana is such a big state, yeah. we meet at noon to like five, we go to dinner at night, the next morning we meet again until noon and everybody leaves because you have to drive so far. Yeah, yeah. And you have to just like stay, stay in the hotel nights and that kind of thing. Right, right. But also a different health center hosts it, so then like this last time it was my turn. And I hosted it with um, a doctor from Missoula who ended up doing most of the work because I ended up being under the weather and stuff. But um, it was, you had like different subject lines. We mm. had input from, this, from the other CMOs. What do you need us to cover? Do you need to bring somebody in to cover this for you guys? And our PCA helped all that happen. That's so great. So it's always like bring your, bring your you know, peer review sheets or what are you doing about this? Wow, that's great. This, that's always a section of time, just like this. It's just this kind of thing. Yeah. But your own, only what you deal with in Montana or California or whatever. Sure. Mm -hmm. It's great. It's really nice. Any other examples you'd have? Any uh, yeah, although I might, might, might have had the same idea. Go ahead. <laughs> just sharing out, to build on that idea of what the city says, there are conversations, I'm Bruce Gabriel with the Northwest Regional PCA, and part of the partnership here at the conference is between the three regions clinical track, we're having conversations here about exactly that question. How can we better coordinate some mm -hmm. of the support, peer networking, the training pieces across? I think we're really looking to hear from you all around ways to do that. Where we, we create the model in Montana and find a way to bring that kind of resource out more fully and share it across the three regions, not just at the conference, but yeah. on an ongoing basis. So early stages of the conversation, well, that's it really great. does go to exactly the kind of people you're raising. Why should those we each of us be inventing or reinventing the wheel mm -hmm. when there are opportunities to be more peer networking around these very issues? Right. Good I think you've already mentioned this, but I think one of the things that's really going to be critical to make this work is we have to figure out what the what the payment system is going to look like, mm -hmm. how it's going to measure. I, I've said this before, I think, to some of these people, but for me, this feels like we're now assigned to quad, cross the quality chasm. We are on our motorcycle and the ramp for taking off is built. Yeah. And the ramp for landing on the other side is not built yet. <laughs> and we have a few seconds to decide, are yeah. we going to hit the brake or are we going to go faster yeah, and yeah. hope that they build the landing? Well, I don't know. Yeah. Right now, I still get paid under the old system, but they want me to build the new system. And, and that's very difficult to do. And it would seem to me that we have more power collectively than yeah. we do individually to say, you know, we, we need you to measure this in a particular way. And there, there's a few early things happening, but I saw my first patient for a Medicare annual mm -hmm. compensated planning physical. And and somebody came to his house and talked to him, and they called my coordinator, and they loaded his chart. But they loaded his chart with um, he, needs a, he needs an A1C, and he needs a diabetic foot exam, and two other things. 
and he's a 36-year-old guy who doesn't have diabetes. Mm. <laughs> and when, I finally, when I finally made enough calls to Medicare, oh, yes. to the company that was contracted with the insurer that was doing the quality, they said, yeah, well, he's Medicare, so we just measure him all the same way because we don't have the time or the energy to sort mm -hmm. out the young Medicares because he had mental health diagnosis. Yeah, yeah, well, I was like, what? Well, then what good so is that to you? Want, yeah, so it's actually a lot you more You want work. me to waste time and resources Doing. Yeah. And and the poor person at the house at the that the company I was talking to said, well they measure me on the same thing. It's not my fault. <laughs> you know, I'm just trying to do yeah, the best yeah. that I can. So somehow as a group we have to say, you know, we need real measurements. Right. You know, you can't just say sorry, we're too lazy to fix that. You're going to have to live with it. Yeah. We're going to judge you based on what you do with all of our Medicare patients, even the ones that we don't really need an A1C on. Wow. Anyway. Well, let's yeah, let's. Well, um, I have a question about your on the template for for the future mm -hmm. on the scheduling. Are you guys doing? Is that how your scheduling looks right now, or is that your future? No, that's also future for us. I mean, some of those these are bits and pieces from places like Group Health and other places so that have are, done some of these. Is there anybody doing that right now? I mean, the Iora example that I, that I gave you is actually doing that. I showed you one snapshot of, of their work, but they actually are doing a lot of that. So a lot how, of that. how are they dealing with access for their patients? Mm -hmm. How do they get all their patients in? Because looking at that, the providers are physically seeing like a few patients. A few patients, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and how are they getting paid? Do they get paid for those phone contacts? Do they get paid for the electronic? Are they able to bill for that? I mean, yeah. Because we can't in Montana. Right, right. No, it, not not just in Montana. I mean, I think it depends on the model. I mean, that's largely an employer-sponsored plan. It's almost like a direct primary care model that they have. So I think that's why they're able to do some of that. But um, but I mean, your your point is well taken. Many places are not able to do all of that yet. But in the places where they have done it, again, very different systems, but some of that is from group health literature around kind of creating time and space for phone visits and electronic visits and building that into the actual templates so that people have time and it's, and it's valued um, by giving, being given time. Um, and they, you know, they developed a lot of, um, the VA also did its kind of telephone-based one like that too, and they published on that, and they, they have very specific kind of like what are the things that are more amenable to, to telephonic visits versus, you know, in-person visits. And I think the real shift is that um, not everybody that comes in needs to be seen by the provider. And that's really what, the, that's really what that, that schedule change is, is reflecting, that, you know, some of them, you know, for there are other places where you see group visits and those kind of things where, you know, I have 10 people that have diabetes, that the teaching is going to be the same, the general kind of response um, is going to be the same. So why can't we kind of gain economies of scale? But those ones, and I let somebody that is skilled in talking about that talk with those patients, and I can see some other ones. Um, the, ri the, the risk, and I'll just throw that out there, of doing some of that sometimes is that uh, if somebody's taking, you know, the kind of stable or maybe poorly controlled diabetic or high blood pressure patients, and seeing them understanding order and kind of managing that. Um, someone else has seen your colds, your URIs, and you know those those you know UTIs or things like that. Um, then that means the provider is seeing some of the more complex things, which in theory we want to do, right? But at the same time, you also need to have the day kind of broken up by a few other things that can you know if you have back to back you know multi morbidity patients that you know have significant needs that's that actually is, is 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 pretty burdensome so you know you have to figure out how to strike that balance and what other members of the care team can actually kind of co-manage those visits yeah, the other thing though is that many of these contacts that the whatever the provider may whatever novel training they have or whatever there's still documentation that's required based around mm -hmm. the current documentation system are slow and burdensome, so even though it might be a quick touch to a patient on a phone or whatever, yeah, there's still just, I mean, heck, just to just to chart a Coumadin lab that comes back takes yeah. half a day. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I think I think that's part of why, like, when you think about like reimbursing it in the in the future, of course, like I said, we're not doing that at my clinic, but reimbursing for tele telephone time because right now 
you do it anyway, right? You spend the time, you're, you're charting probably in three or four different screens, you know, go see this one, see this one, the lab is addressed here, send it to someone, and, and, and no one, no one cares <laughs> that you did that, right? <laughs> no one's valuing it by paying for it or anything like that. So it's just, it's kind of like, it's, it's important work, but it's not valued. And so, yeah. Okay, I think, so one more? That, okay. that is why I think that as working together is important. Yeah. Because we have all these highly skilled professionals who are having to do all the documentation because CMS has ruled that we have to. Mm -hmm. And I think that somehow we need to be able to come together as a voice to say, we have these skilled people working with this. Why can't they type that in for me? I right. mean, unless they're an official scribe, <coughs> there's that risk. Right, right. And are we willing to take it? To or take are it. we going to stand up and say, we need to change the rules? Yeah, yeah. I think it's I think it's important to have a voice at the tables where some of these decisions are made because a lot of times the reality of what this means, you know, I, I remember working with some people about our EHR transformation. They say, well, it's only you know the, the EHR people say, but it's only three or three more clicks, you know, and, and so in their mind it's only three more clicks, but in my mind, you know, three more clicks is a lot of clicks, you know. That's you know, can you how can we just make this one? And so if you're not at the tables where those conversations are, are happening, people don't really realize what three more clicks or you know 10 more minutes you know per patient or 10 more minutes you know per document actually mean so that's another thing that i think is really important aside of kind of the bringing the group together trying to figure out how to be part of where the people that are making decisions on reimbursement and financing actually are are talking i have to say that what you said that um your day and how you want it to be <laughs> we all went what? <laughs> she has to enter her own mammogram Yeah, yeah. Your nurse should do that for you. So we're all like back there cringing, going, that's her day, how horrible. Yeah. yeah but, um, that is the way yeah. it should be. They should, they should do a lot of that stuff without us. They don't need us to tell them to do that. That's preventive. They're 40 and older. What are they going to You don't need me. Right. You don't need me. I know. That's my that's my new thing. You don't need me. That's when I'm gonna go back to work saying <laughs> you don't need me. <laughs> do everything else. <laughs> yeah. All right, so I'm getting the, the eye back there. I think we're out of time. <laughs> Thank you all so much for your time.